Thanks for being with me tonight. I'm Johnny Robertson. We are live on What Does the Bible Say? Hope we do appreciate you being with us tonight. Say last night about and midnight. we hope that uh, the information that we are presenting is going to be helpful and useful to you. This is a very, very serious broadcast. We take on the most difficult uh, studies, questions, problems in the world. And we don't really shy away from anything. And the reason why is because 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 tells us that we have basically everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge that, we, that is contained in God's Word. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. We, we need nothing else. We need to be better students of God's Word. One of the things that we deal with on a regular basis has to do with this question. Why did I come here? Why, a, a gentleman asked last week, I think it was, two weeks ago, he asked, why did you guys come up here from Texas? And I want you to know that when I was in Texas, I was preaching the exact same thing. When I was in um, Memphis, Tennessee, I was preaching the exact same thing. When I lived in the Marshall Islands, the same thing. Second time in the Marshall Islands, same thing. Second time to return to Virginia, same thing. Basically, wherever I've been, I've preached the exact same thing the exact same way. Someone might say, well, did you have a camera? Well, I didn't always have my own camera, but yes, the news has been involved. My first time to go to a faith healing explosion was in Memphis, Tennessee, and the Memphis, uh, one of the ABC, NBC, CBS, I can't remember which one, one of the affiliates, uh, uh, videoed us being there, me being there, on the 10 o'clock nightly news they realized that everybody was not there to support this faith healing explosion done by a Pentecostal group out of Houston, Texas, uh, filling the Coliseum in Memphis, Tennessee, but we were there to oppose it. And the news picked it up. So yes, the cameras have always been a part of it because it, whether you like it or not, folks, religion is controversial. And anytime you have persons who will openly oppose certain things being right or wrong, it is controversial. I don't try to be controversial, but when I read John 15 about Jesus, Jesus basically told His disciples, if the world hated me, it'll hate you. If it loved me, it will love you. And Jesus in John 15, 22 said that they had not had sin except that He had removed their cloak. Now, that's what we're doing. We're removing the cloak in many instances that people hide behind the things uh, the, the situations where they say they're doing right, we come along and shine the Bible light on it, and guess what? It's wrong. Tonight, I want to give a lesson that I hope will help you to understand better that you must have something like this in your life. I want to begin with the Psalm of David. In Psalm 141, verse 5, the Bible says, Let righteousness smite me, it shall be a kindness. And let him reprove me, it shall be excellent oil which shall not break my head. This is a very beautiful passage, and it is one that is difficult to understand. But tonight, when we get through, I hope that you will be able to say, I am so thankful that there is a righteous person who is in this area, and I'm so thankful that someone is willing to reprove me, because you know what? When a righteous person smites me, it's kindness. And when he reproves me, it shall be excellent oil, it shall not break my head. Now folks, I think one of the biggest barriers that we have in regard to understanding this particular scripture is a barrier that is put up on a regular basis by maybe well-meaning individuals. It is individuals who basically go around saying, well, what is a righteous person? You know, the first thing we need to deal with is we need to deal with what is righteousness. You see, I have it here in a question mark, let the righteous smite me. Well, the first problem we're going to have is a lot of people don't know what righteousness is. And number two, people do not agree on who is righteous. So tonight, what we need to do is we need to deal with these two questions. Number one, what is righteousness? Well, the psalmist is who we're reading after. And he said, let the righteous smite me and it shall be kindness. Well, what is righteousness, David? My tongue shall speak of thy word for all thy commandments are righteousness. All of God's commandments are righteous. They are righteousness. If they had been kept, they would. the persons who were involved with them would be righteous. But folks, all of God's commandments today will not make you righteous. If you set out 
and you read through your Bible and you get started and you get to Genesis 6 and it talks to Noah about building an ark. If you build an ark today, it will not be your righteousness. Now, I've seen a lot of individuals that have actually done things that they uh, want to uh, show, uh, make a show and display uh, things for God. Some have even built replicas of the ark and I don't know, uh, unless they were using it for a teaching tool, it didn't do them any good. So all of God's commandments are righteousness, but all of us are not supposed to do all of the things that are contained in God's commandments. There are several things that were righteousness for the individual that would have been considered righteousness for the individual who was commanded to do it, but today you would not be righteous if you did it. So we need to understand that all of God's commandments are righteousness, but we must find the commandments that apply to us. Okay, we've built on that. Now let's move to the next statement. Who is a righteous person? Because you see, what we're actually going to be dealing with next is we're going to say, well, who has the right to actually uh, bring about this smiting? And folks, smiting is not a bad word in the sense that it's being used here. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, he actually says that he buffeted his body on a daily basis. Let me put that in right quick, give you a chance to look at it. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, the Apostle Paul says that he buffeted his body daily. Let's look at this under another version. Uh, we're looking at the King James Version. Um, let's see, let's compare it to, say, the American Standard. I keep my body under, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. So he controls his body is what he says. Let's look at the New King James. But I keep under my body. Uh, let's see, I actually did that wrong. Uh, but I discipline my body. All right, let's look at the American Standard again. American Standard says, but I buffet my body and bring it un into bondage. Okay, so we see these different ways of, of translating that verse. Uh, the King James says, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I preach to others I myself become a castaway. So one said I buff it, the other says I keep it under, one says I bring it into bondage. So this is the idea, let the righteous smite me. Well, who is a righteous person? Now that is a difficult thing. Because many individuals today say, well, if you say that you're righteous and anybody else is not righteous, in other words, you're going to reprove someone or you're going to smite them, as David said, you're going to correct them, as David said, then uh, you're probably going to have a lot of flack. You're going to get a lot of criticism for individuals because they're going to say, well, you know, you're not supposed to say you're righteous. Well, let's, let's examine what people tell you with what Jesus said when He came on the scene. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, Jesus said, for I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Look at Jesus. Did Jesus believe this idea that, none, that, that you can't say that you're righteous and that you cannot compare your righteousness with another person? Did Jesus agree with that? As a matter of fact, no. Jesus said, you're not even going to get into my kingdom unless your righteousness exceed a particular group. And guess what? He named their names. Now, folks, is that what we're hearing today? Individuals say today that if you ever uh, bash anybody or down anybody, well, it, it sounded like Jesus recognized, well, okay, you know what they would say? Well, you're not Jesus. Well, guess what? The apostles did the same thing. The same individuals that were Jesus' enemy, the scribes and the Pharisees, they were the apostles' enemy. They were the teachers in the New Testament's enemy. Jesus said that your righteousness can actually be examined. And if your righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you can't even get into His kingdom. Now that's pretty strong language going towards the idea that we can say that our righteousness is actually a righteousness that exceeds other people. Well, you know what a lot of people would say? A lot of people say, well, wouldn't that be holier than thou? Wouldn't you then be uh, guilty of being holier than thou? Now, wait a minute. It seems to me that you need to be holier than some people. You know, most of the time what I have come uh, to realize has been my experience that persons who put this holier than thou mantle on you, they usually are doing something wrong. A lot of times you maybe have corrected somebody who was doing something and they say, you think you're so holy. You think you're holier than thou. You're so, he's holier than thou. Well, you know what? We're supposed to be holier than some people. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, unless you're more righteous than the Pharisees and the scribes, 
you're not going to get into my kingdom. And now, let's examine this holier than thou thought. Where did it come from? Well, some people might quote Luke 18 verse 9, where Jesus spake a parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. And they would say immediately, now see there, Jesus has a parable in which He is going to point out these individuals who are self-righteous and they despise others. Now what some people will draw from that is nobody gets, has a right to say that they're righteous. Wait a minute. You've got Matthew 5.20 saying you better be more righteous than the scribes and the Pharisees. And then you've got individuals trying to use Luke 18.9 and say that if you say that you're more righteous then you are actually doing wrong because Jesus gave this parable where the um, individuals are in the temple and one of them is saying that he's righteous and the other is uh, a sinner. And Jesus used that parable, um, uh, they spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. But wait a minute. Could it be the case that there are some people out there that trust in themselves and they are self-righteous? But that doesn't mean that no one is righteous, does it? Well, let's examine this. Let's examine this idea as we go along. Notice this. Let the righteous smite me. Who is the righteous? Is there anybody that can uh, be righteous and correct you? Well, in Luke chapter 1, verse 6, when we start, let's say we're going to do a, a study of the New Testament and find out if anybody was righteous. Luke 1, 6, and they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord blameless. Well, we don't have a name here. In Luke 1, 6, who is it? Who is it? Whoever it is that, the, that is the subject of this particular scripture, the Bible says that they were righteous and they were walking in all the commandments and the ordinances blameless. Well, who is it? Well, notice who it is. Luke 1, 5, one verse before. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zacchaeus, uh, sorry, Zacharias of the uh, course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. Now bring in verse 6. They were both righteous. They were keeping all the commandments, uh, commandments and they were blameless. So guess what? There is, there were individuals in the first century or in the Bible history that were righteous. They were blameless before God. As a matter of fact, this, the, the, the scriptures are very clear that there are individuals that are righteous. But let's notice because we know that somebody's going to argue with us. Somebody's going to immediately jump in and say, wait a minute, I remember John chapter 8 verse 1 and following. Jesus went into the Mount of Olives and early in the morning came again into the temple and all the people came to Him and He sat down and He taught them and the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto Him a woman taken in adultery when they had set her in the midst. You know the rest of the story. When they set her in the midst, they basically began to question Jesus what He was going to say about her. Remember Jesus said to these individuals, which of you is without sin cast the first stone? Well, you know... It is the case, y'all, that a lot of people don't pay attention to their Bible when, they, when they're reading. They don't really study. If you paid any attention at all, you would have noticed it's the very group of individuals that Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you can't enter into the kingdom of heaven. These are Jesus' rivals, His arch enemies, the individuals that He named on several occasions. Watch out for them. In Matthew chapter 15, He talked about the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees. Watch out for the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Here they are. They're the ones who brought this woman in front of Jesus says that she was taken in the, in the act of adultery, taken in adultery, and they want Jesus to make a judgment about her. Is it any surprise that Jesus said to these individuals, which of you is without sin, cast the first stone? Do you realize what was going on in this particular setting? Look at this. In Deuteronomy chapter 22, 22, the law is very clear. These scribes and these Pharisees knew that if they were going to bring a woman caught in adultery, caught in adultery, when you catch somebody in adultery, there has to be another person or you didn't catch them. They caught her in adultery. If a man be found lying with a woman married to an husband, then they shall both of them die, both the man that lay with the woman and the woman, so that so shall thou put away evil from Israel. Deuteronomy 17.7 7 says that the witnesses will cast the first stone. Now, we know that they only brought the woman. All we have to do is back up and we see that they only brought the woman. The woman is the only one that the scribes and the Pharisees, remember Matthew 5, 20, except your righteousness exceed these folks, you can't enter into my kingdom. These folks are not going to do things right. Anytime you see the scribes and the Pharisees, get ready. They're going to be trying to trap Jesus. They're not doing what's right. They're not individuals that are righteous. So let's say this tonight. 
Don't use John chapter 8 to say that you can never point out someone's sin because Jesus said to you and to me, you who are without sin cast the first stone. He didn't say that to us. He said this to his rivals, his arch enemies, the scribes and the Pharisees, who had brought this woman unjustly, according to Deuteronomy 22, 22, in front of him and were asking him to follow a multitude to sin. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 1 through 3, it is said there, you do not follow a multitude to do evil. Jesus wasn't going to be involved with these scribes and the Pharisees. He wasn't going to follow them to do a multi follow a multitude to do evil. They had missed. Uh, mistaken the law, misused the law, they didn't bring the man, and they weren't ready to stone her anyway. So Jesus basically said, which of you is without sin, cast the first stone. Which of who? Scribes and Pharisees. Well, who are the scribes and Pharisees? Well, they're the ones that Jesus uh, taught on the Sermon on the Mount, unless your righteousness exceed their righteousness, you can't even get into my kingdom. So, absolutely, John chapter 8 is not a scripture that you can use when somebody points to your error or your misbehavior and you turn to them and say, well, if you, don't have, any, if you have any sin, you can't cast a stone. That was not spoken to the general population. It was spoken to the scribes and Pharisees. Now, folks, I know tonight, if you're watching our broadcast, you're learning something tonight. You're seeing that you just can't use a passage that applies to a very wicked group of individuals that Jesus said was without, that had sins and would, He would not allow them to be involved in any kind of judgment. He wouldn't participate with them at all. You can't use this to point to the general population and say nobody is righteous. Jesus said nobody is righteous. Nobody can point out anybody's sin. Therefore, there is no righteous person that can smite you and it be kindness. There is no person that can re reprove you and it be uh, excellent oil upon your head. Now, well, I know there's probably going to be some more controversy. Some other individuals are going to say, well, wait a minute. I know, Johnny, that you're building up to be the righteous person and you're going to rebuke us. You're going to smite us and you're going to say that, it should, you should, they, that we all should receive it as kindness and it should be excellent oil. But you forgot about Romans chapter 3, verse 10, which says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Now, wait a minute. If no one is righteous... How about Zacharias and Elizabeth? Luke chapter 1, verse 5 and 6 that we just read. Here are, were two individuals that the Bible said were righteous. They walked in all the commandments and they were blameless before the Lord. No one is righteous, Romans 3.10. Is that what this verse is really teaching? What does this verse mean? Is it possible that it is saying that nobody has ever been righteous? Well, if that's the case, then your pastor is not righteous either. Because, because look at this, one of the qualifications for a pastor, a bishop, an elder, who is the same person, if you put Titus chapter 1 verse 5 here, you will find that Titus calls a bishop an elder. Elder, bishop, pastor, same person. Here's qualification. This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desire the good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Guess what? All you guys running around town claim to be bishops. Guess what? You might as well say, if you've got bishop alongside your name, if you claim that this is the work you're involved in, then you might as well say that you're blameless, that you've met this qualification. Now, wait a minute. I thought you said, no, there's nobody that's righteous. I thought you said that Paul was teaching that nobody has ever been righteous. No, not one. And actually, this is a quote from the psalm. Well, you see what we have to do? We have to get down to the meaning. What could this possibly mean? What could it mean that there is none righteous? No, not one. And yet the bishop has to be blameless, which is the same thing. He's without blame. He's a righteous man. And in order to be a bishop, in order to be selected, one of the qualifications, he has to be blameless. There can't be anything that someone can bring up that he's guilty of. This is a quandary that you're in if you're going to say that no one is righteous. Well, okay, let's, let's study on then. Okay, what is the answer to Romans 3.10? That there's none righteous. Here's the answer. Philippians 3.9. Paul said, And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Now folks, tonight, here is where the crux of the matter is. This is where the big fight is. This is where the misunderstanding is. You see, there were individuals in the Old Testament who were righteous. Now they were not righteous because they had kept the law themselves. In other words, they had never made a mistake. That would be your own righteousness, which is of the law. In other words, these individuals 
We'll see one in a moment who basically claim that they're keeping all the laws and they're righteous in and of themselves. But Paul says, I'll be found in Christ, not having mine own righteousness, which is the law. But what kind of righteousness will you have, Paul? But that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. You see, a righteous person who is truly righteous today is righteous as a result of trusting in Jesus' blood to have cleansed him from unrighteousness and trusting in God who will pronounce you unrighteous as a result of you being obedient to His Son. You see, it's trust in Jesus Christ. It's trust in God that cures your unrighteousness, that cleanses your unrighteousness. You know, folks, we need to realize today that things in the Old Testament times really are similar to the New Testament times. Let's go back to Luke 18 verse 9. In Luke 18 verse 9, this parable is exactly about Romans, uh, Philippians chapter 3 verse 9. Look at this. Philippians 3 verse 9, And be found in Him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law. Jesus dealt with individuals who had their own righteousness. They considered themselves to be righteous and they despised others. Let's notice one of them. Notice if you would with me. In Luke chapter... Uh, 18, verse 13. And the publican standing afar off would not so much as lift up his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, Be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for every one that exalteth himself shall be abased. He that humbled himself shall be exalted. Now, do you think this individual actually thought that he was righteous in and of himself? Or was he an individual who trusted in God? Look at this. Be merciful to me, a sinner. He had faith in God. He did not consider himself to be righteous as a result of having kept all of the laws. He actually is showing you that he's trusting in God. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. He is a righteous person. Why? Because he humbled himself. Now, let's notice together. This is how the Old Testament was. In the Old Testament days, individuals like David, remember David wrote this psalm, Psalm 141 verse 5, Let the righteous smite me. Look how Paul chooses David as the subject of who is a blessed individual under the Old Testament system. You see this publican in Luke chapter 18 who's standing in the temple, by the way, he is simply characteristic of many people under the Old Testament system. Let's read Paul. Let's listen to him talk about Old Testament characters. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man to whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now my friend tonight, if you conclude from this passage that David never had to keep one iota of the law, you are misrepresenting and misunderstanding. You're misunderstanding first and misre misrepresenting what Paul is saying. Paul is not saying that a person never had to do anything. Paul is saying that this individual was justified in spite of the fact that he didn't do what he was supposed to do. He actually was justified in spite of the fact that he failed to keep all the works of the law. We all know that David, the man who wrote this Psalm 141 verse 5, that David actually was an individual who had committed many atrocities. He had uh, looked upon a woman that was not his wife, looked upon her to, uh, to fornicate in his mind. He conjured up a plan in which her husband ended up being killed by one of his faithful captains. He then takes the wife and marries her. And yet Nathan, a righteous man, came and smote David. How did he smite David? He told him a parable about a man that had one ewe lamb and another man actually kill that lamb to feed a, visit, a visiting friend. And David said, who is this individual he's going to have to pay? And Nathan said, you are the man. And David said, I have sinned. You see, a righteous man smote David and it was a kindness to David. It was excellent oil when Nathan reproved him. But no one could say tonight, that David is affirming that you don't have to do anything under the law. David had to correct himself. 
David found mercy because he was a humble individual and had a contrite spirit and accepted Nathan's word. And guess what? Even as David also describeth the, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Was David righteous because of his works? No. He was an atrocious individual right here. But yet God imputed righteousness to him. Why? Because he humbled himself and he admitted what he had done and he pleaded with God to forgive him. He had faith in God saying, Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Who will the, who will the Lord not impute sin to? Individuals like the publican in Luke chapter 18, 13. Now, my friends, do not be confused tonight. The publican is not an example for you to become a child of God. The publican was already a child of God. You can have people say what they want to about publicans. This man was standing in the temple. He was there uh, with the other guy that we're going to notice here in just a little bit. Same place. He was there speaking to God, asking Him to be merciful unto him a sinner, and he was justified because he humbled himself before God. David was a child of God too, and David received the same results as a, fact of the, as, a, as a result of the fact that he humbled himself and trusted in God. And the Bible says, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. What kind of man? A man who constantly seeks after righteousness. A man who constantly has faith in God to cleanse him through whatever means is available at the time. During this time, it was the offering of sacrifices. Today, it is different. Well, let's notice. You see... David actually was taking advantage of the blessings that God had given to the children of Israel. Now the publican is doing exactly what Solomon was told that God would do. You see, the publican was standing at the temple just like God told Solomon to do in 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. Speaking to the Jews, if my people... That was the Jews. This is written to Solomon. Solomon is building the temple right here. He's inaugurating it. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their righteousness and will heal their land. Now mine eyes shall be open and my ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. What place do you think that was? Second Chronicles chapter 7. You back up and you'll see they were in the temple. This was the inauguration of the brand new temple in Jerusalem. This was said to Solomon and all the people and the publican is doing this very thing that God said that they needed to do and if they did that, that he would hear and he would forgive their sins. And the, and the publican went to his house justified. A child of God who was already of the family of Abraham, he went and was justified. But wait a minute. Remember this parable actually involves persons who trusted in themselves. Luke 18 evidently has some other character, doesn't it? Not just the publican. Yes, it does. As a matter of fact, this particular parable is actually about the Pharisees. There we go. The arch rivals of Jesus. The ones Jesus started out talking about in the Sermon on the Mount. The scribes and the Pharisees. The ones that brought the woman supposedly caught in adultery. You know what? I don't say that woman was caught in adultery. I say allegedly. I don't trust a scribe and a Pharisee as far as I can throw them. If they are involved, it's probably a trap. And Jesus did not take their testimony about that woman. She said, he said, woman, where are your accusers? She said, none, Lord. He said, neither do I accuse thee. Why? He couldn't accuse her. The scribes and the Pharisees had falsely brought her, her in front of him. The man was not with her. And Deuteronomy 22, 22 says the man has to be there. And if it truly is a case of adultery, as de described in Deuteronomy 22, 22, then the men who brought her there were supposed to pick up stones and be the first ones as witnesses to cast stones. They were not willing to be involved in that. So Jesus was not going to participate in this multitude to do evil. I say she was allegedly caught in, in adultery because the Pharisees are the ones who brought her. I don't trust the Pharisees and the scribes any more than Jesus did. And Jesus told this parable to actually talk to them about certain persons who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. How did they act? Here they are. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as this publican. I fast twice a week and I give tithes of all that I possess. And on and on he went. But what did the publican do? The publican did just exactly like God told Solomon that if they would do in that place, then he would forgive their sins. He did exactly as Paul said that David did. That David admitted his sins when Nathan talked to him about them and God forgave him. You see, folks, it is not wrong to say 
that you are a righteous person. What is wrong is how you ended up being a righteous person. If you stand as the publican did, I mean as the Pharisee did, and proclaim your righteousness and don't realize that God is allowing you to be righteous if you're righteous. How is that? We're talking about a blessedness that God has given to us in which He will not impute sins to our case. Blessed is the man to whom God will not impute sins. We have to trust in God that He is forgiving us our sins on a constant basis. You see, folks, this is a very, very important piece of information I think people have missed. Do you know being righteous has not changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament in the sense that there were righteous people, not any righteous people in the Old Testament, but there are in the New Testament. The thing that has changed is just the information about how they became righteous. There are righteous people in the Old Testament. Do you not think that there are going to be people that we're going to see in heaven? Is Abraham, doesn't Abraham have a bosom where righteous people are said to be in Luke chapter 16? In the account of the rich man and Lazarus? Lazarus was in uh, Abraham's bosom. Jesus spoke with Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 7 and Elijah. Is it not the case that there are individuals that were righteous? Well, how were they righteous? Romans 3.10 says none is righteous. No, not one. Oh, there are individuals. David is considered to be righteous. How is it that they're righteous? Being righteous has not changed just the information about the how. They had to trust in God to be righteous. We have to trust in God. The difference today is we know how it's accomplished. We know the story about God's love for mankind and the sending of His Son which allowed Him to say that individuals are righteous. You see, that's the important part. Look at this. This is the explanation of Romans chapter 3, verse 25. Romans 3, 25 is actually telling us how God can be a just judge and pronounce us righteous when we know that we're not. How does He do that? You see, the information is revealed now. The mystery of godliness, the mystery of how God is going to count us to be righteous and those other individuals in the Old Testament, counting them righteous, it's actually been revealed. Here it is. Whom God, speaking of Jesus, has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. What is a propitiation? Propitiation is the exact same Greek word. If you're reading the Old Testament in Greek instead of Hebrew, you're going to see this word propitiation. It is translated mercy seat in uh, Exodus chapter 25. The mercy seat, the Greek word for the mercy seat is the same Greek word as is translated propitiation right here. It's the covering. Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a covering, a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness, that is God's righteousness, for removing sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, God's righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. You see, the devil is actually saying that God is unjust for forgiving people. The devil knows that Moses sinned. The devil and uh, Michael and, and the archangel, uh, I, I'm maybe getting that part wrong. Let me just uh, review my brain just a minute. Sometimes I uh, have what is known as a, a chemo moment. Michael the archangel, Jude 9, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Listen, the devil expected that Moses belonged to him. Why? Moses didn't get to go into the promised land. How in the world could Moses be on the Mount of Transfiguration talking with Jesus later in Matthew 17, but yet Moses sinned in striking the rock and didn't get to go into the promised land, but he still gets into uh, paradise. How does that happen? And see, the devil accuses God. You're unjust. You're unrighteous for letting these individuals who we all know were sinners. How is it that they ended up being on the side of the righteous? Here's how. Because God knew that He was going to send His Son and have Him shed His blood. Jesus' blood was shed in a, in a picture in all of the uh, blood of bulls and goats. All of those sacrifices were simply pictures of what God was eventually going to do and all that blood that was shed back there in the Old Testament for the remission of sins is only possible the remission is only possible because God sent His Son as the perfect sacrifice, which was actually being prefigured and pre-shadowed, foreshadowed in those sacrifices. Now let's read this again. You see, being righteous has not changed, just the information about how. 
Those individuals were righteous through faith in God and the blood of those sacrifices that God somehow or other was going to make this thing come out right. It, they didn't understand how that the blood of bulls and goats was forgiving sins, but eventually God made it all open to our understanding whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare God's righteousness for removing sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness that He might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. You see, the publican, he was a sinner. How could God justify the publican? When the, the, the Pharisee was telling all the things that he had done, but yet God pronounced justification to the publican. How could God do that? Everybody knows the publicans are sinners. Here's how God did it. God knew that He was going to send His Son and His Son's blood was going to be shed. It was going to cover those sins. And God would no longer be unjust. The Pharisee couldn't say, God, why did you forgive that, that publican? That's unjust of you. Look at me. I've been tithing. I've been keeping all these laws from my childhood up. Look at this publican. And, and you've, you've justified him? How can God be just? How can He be righteous in doing that? The reason why He can is because God said all along that a person who will humble himself and will trust in God as the means by which he's justified, that that person will be the person who is righteous, not the person who attributes his own righteousness to things that he's done and, and arrays those before God. You see, folks, you can be a righteous person. You better be a righteous person. You need to be a righteous person. But you won't be righteous because you've kept every jot and tittle. You'll be righteous through faith in God through Jesus Christ who have cleansed or covered your sins. You'll be a person who is blessed as a result of the fact that God will not impute righteousness to your case because you trust in God through His Son to constantly forgive you of your sins. You see, that's what's being discussed here. And this evening, you can be a righteous person. As a matter of fact, as we discuss this lesson, I think I'm going to be able to demonstrate that you should be a righteous person, no doubt about it. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. You know, as Jesus was teaching how they were to deal with one another, it was confusing to these individuals because they were not used to this kind of mercy that God was extending or that Jesus was talking to them about. Then came Peter unto the Lord. Then came Peter unto him and said, Lord, how oft shall I, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Do you know the context of this passage? The context of this passage is Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. If your brother sin against thee, uh, if your brother trespass against thee, then you're to go to him privately. You see, when two individuals have a situation that's private, where a trespass is against you, we're not talking about a public trespass that's in front of everybody. We're talking about something somebody did to you. You're supposed to go to them privately, and you're supposed to show him his fault. And if he hears you, you've gained your brother. But if he doesn't hear you, take two or three witnesses. And if he doesn't hear them, then you basically tell it to the church. And if he doesn't tell, listen to the church, then let him be to you as a heathen and a publican. And so as we're discussing this, in the context of this, Jesus continues to, te to, to teach about forgiveness, and Peter becomes so amazed at the forgiving nature of Jesus, the willingness of Jesus to forgive, the willingness of God to forgive, then Peter said, came to him and said, Lord, how oft shall I, my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? And Jesus said, No, I say not unto thee seven times, but 490 times. Seven times seventy. You know, folks, you might be amazed and say, well, boy, that's a lot of forgiveness. That's not really a lot of forgiveness. Do you know that you can count up the amount of sacrifices that priests offered in a regular year? Do you know there was a morning sacrifice and an evening sacrifice? That's two sacrifices every day. Well, there's 365 days in a year. If there's two sacrifices every day, 365 days a year, well, that's over 700 sacrifices right there. Just the morning and the evening sacrifice. That the, uh, that the priest was offering for the people of the land at all times. So really, every year God was forgiving them 700 or more times. And if you count up all the feast sacrifices and the things that were required on a regular basis, you get over 1,100 sacrifices every year that the priests were offering for the people of Israel. But see, between individuals, he says, until 70 times 70. Now, folks, aren't we seeing that we're supposed to be forgiving each other. Why is that? Because God is forgiving us. Blessed is the man to whom God will not impute sin. 
individuals who trust in God and constantly try to humble themselves and repent. God said in the Old Testament to Solomon and to David and to the publican through Jesus in Luke 18, you can be justified even though you are a person who's not perfect. You see, folks, this is very interesting information and it's something that people have missed. And why am I going into it in this way? Because somebody has to tell somebody else that somebody is wrong. But guess what? Individuals today do not believe that anybody can say they're righteous. Your own, what does the Bible say? Yes, David. I was wondering the question you told the Pharisee. You know, uh, they burned out prostitute uh, Mary Magdalene to didn't you say? Didn't you say last week you weren't going to call back? Yeah, but uh, I just say I just asked forgiveness. And okay, what? well, I don't have my phone lines up, so would you wait till we put our phone lines up? Okay. Uh, this gentleman said he wasn't going to call back in, and I don't mind him calling back in, but we didn't have our phone lines up. He must have memorized the, the phone number. So, Now look, folks, don't, don't, don't lose your train of thought. Don't lose your train of thought. Somebody has got to be righteous because somebody has to tell other people when they do wrong. And notice this. You, now, now I, I, let me just say it this way. Let's just say tonight. Let's say tonight that I said to you, God is not hearing your prayers. I bet you would be so aggravated with me that you just would have a, a fit. We have people call on here all the time and they just get so upset when I say that God doesn't hear your prayers. Well, look at this. The Bible says in order for God to hear your prayers, you have to be righteous. Well, I hear people call up on my broadcast and, and out in the streets and everywhere else say, well, you can't say that you're righteous. Nobody's righteous. Why, if you say you're righteous, you're self-righteous. Well, you're holier than thou. You're proclaiming you're righteous. Well, I'll tell you what. If you're not righteous, then God doesn't hear your prayers. So I guess none of y'all have God he hearing your prayers. How is it that any of y'all uh, have a faith healer, any of these faith healers, how is it that God's answering their prayers? You have to first admit that they're righteous or God's not hearing their prayers. See, you've got this whole thing mixed up. Look at this. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and His ears are open to their prayers. Is God hearing your prayers? Then you must have just said you're righteous. I thought you said nobody was righteous. I thought it was self-righteous to say that you're righteous. I thought it was holier than thou to say that you're righteous. I thought you weren't supposed to ever correct anybody else because you have sins. You who are without sin, cast the first stone. Everybody's got sins so nobody can correct anybody. Well, if everybody's got sins, nobody is having their prayers answered. Because the Bible says, unless you're righteous, God's not hearing your prayers. And do you know what? This is not just a New Testament passage. This is a quote from the Old Testament. This is straight from the psalm. It's actually the psalm where David talks about the blessedness of a man to whom God will not impute uh, 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 sin. The eyes of the Lord, Psalm 34, 15, are upon the righteous, and His ears are open unto their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil. To cut off the remembrance of them from the earth, the righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their trouble. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such that be of a contrite spirit. You see? It's not wrong to say you're righteous. It's wrong to say that you attain righteous as a result, attain righteousness as a result of all of your keeping of God's laws. Folks, we all have made mistakes, and we all will continue to make mistakes. The righteous person in the Old Testament and in the New Testament is an individual that constantly tries, tries to draw nigh to God and is of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Just like David, David could commit or did commit atrocities that likely are above anything and beyond anything any of you that are listening to my broadcast tonight have ever done. Have you ever killed a friend's wife? Have you ever killed one of your faithful uh, servants' wives in order to have her as your wife? You ever done that? I doubt it. Have you ever gone through all the conniving and the things that David did that Nathan had to talk to him about, had to smite him over? Doubt it. But David was, was a person who was guilty of all that. And look at this. He came to God with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. He said, I am a sinner. Nathan said, you're the man. And he said, I have sinned. And he was broken hearted about that sin. And Nathan said that his sin was forgiven. You see, folks, unless you're righteous, God's not hearing your prayers at all. So you see, you're in a dilemma tonight. All of you folks, many individuals over the years have condemned me on this broadcast for pointing out error, saying, who do you think you are? You think you're so righteous. You're so holier than thou. You shouldn't ever say anybody's wrong. You're not supposed to cast any stones because you have sins. Listen, folks, that is just foolishness. 
John 8 was said to the Pharisees. And Luke chapter 18 about the publican, the self-righteous individual, I mean, excuse me, the, uh, the self-righteous individuals in Luke chapter 18 verse 11 was a Pharisee again. And Jesus said, except your righteousness exceed the scribes and the Pharisees, you can't even get into my kingdom. If you're in the kingdom, you better be being righteous. Well, how is it that you're righteous? You constantly are brokenhearted about your sins and you have a contrite spirit towards God and you trust in the faith of Jesus Christ to continually, upon your broken heart and contrite spirit, continually forgive you. You see, we are, righteousness through, we are righteous through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ and through faith in God. Now, it's very important tonight that you understand that. You know, we haven't even discussed tonight getting into the kingdom. If you're not in God's kingdom, in Jesus' kingdom, in God's Son's kingdom, you're not righteous. You're not even in a position for the blood to cleanse you on a regular basis. But see, this morning, we, I mean this evening, we've simply talked about how all of this takes place. And we've talked about the fact that individuals out there who are saying, well, nobody can be righteous. Man, what in the world are you talking about? What book have you been reading? Why, if you're not righteous, He's not hearing your prayers. Bishops have to be blameless in order to even be qualified. They had to be more righteous. They were compared. Jesus was comparing one person's righteousness to another. Unless you're more righteous, unless your righteousness exceed the scribes and the Pharisees, can I say and be right that I'm more righteous than the scribes and the Pharisees? Yes, I can. Does that mean that I tithe more than they do or did back then or that I uh, do more things than they do? No. It means that I have a broken heart and a contrite spirit about my sins and I trust in the blood of Jesus Christ to take care of those sins and I am constantly trying to be obedient. Am I perfect? Absolutely not in the sense that I've never sinned, no. But perfection is actually applied to us just like righteous. God actually counts us perfect. Be ye therefore perfect as I am perfect. He says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13-15, through 15, per uh, perfection is counted to us just like righteousness is counted as a result of the fact that we're constantly brokenhearted about our sin and we're constantly having a contrite spirit or a penitent spirit about the things that we do wrong. Okay, the second part of the verse, Psalm 141 verse 5, where we were. The righteousness, let the righteous smite me. And uh, I'm, I'm going to say, Micah, if you're listening, Ben Emerson is trying to call you. And I don't know if they can hear me back there. Uh, Psalm 141 verse 5, Let the righteous smite me, it shall be a kindness, and let him reprove me, and it shall be excellent oil, which shall not break my head. You know, folks, this is very important information here. That's the second part of the lesson. The first part was the righteous smite me. The second part is, let him reprove me. What does the word reprove mean? Well, the word reprove is actually translated in Matthew chapter 18 verse 15, into another phrase. The exact same Greek word that is translated reprove in the Greek version of the Old Testament is found in Matthew 8, 18, 15 and it is this phrase. Tell him his fault. Tell him his fault. This is the word reprove. More of thy brother shall trespass against thee. Go and tell him his fault. Now wait a minute. I thought that we can't tell anybody that they've sinned. Wouldn't that be bashing? Wouldn't that be downing? You see, only people, the only people that like that kind of talk, that, that kind of doctrine, is the people who want to just sin. They want to get away with doing anything they want to do. People out there who are breaking God's law, who do not want to be controlled, do not want to do anything that is right, want to be rebellious, they're the ones who are always rearing up and saying, don't you talk to me about my trespasses. Don't you talk to me about my sin. You're judging me. You're self-righteous. You're not supposed to cast any stones. None is righteous. No, not one. How dare you say anything to me? But yet Jesus says, If thy brother trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault, or reprove him. And David says, And let him reprove me. It shall be excellent oil, which shall not break my head. You see, these individuals in the Old Testament, it seems to me that they wanted to be corrected. Well, why wouldn't they? Blessed is the man to whom God will not impute sin. When someone corrects you, and you have faith in God that He will forgive you, and you have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, your sin is removed. It's only the rebellious person that stands condemned. You see, the old and the new, the information, the forgiveness is basically there. The only difference is the information. We now know how. They didn't know how all of this was happening. They just knew that through certain sacrifices that they were to keep and things they were to do was happening. But now we know how. We know how the covering takes place. It is through the blood of God's Son and faith in His blood. 
That's how it's done. And today, you're supposed to reprove somebody who trespasses. If it's your brother who trespasses against you personally, tell him his fault. That's what reprove means. Well, let's get into this. Let's see. You see, is Johnny Robertson such a bad guy after all? Because see, that's what we say that we're trying to do. Let the, if the righteous smite me, it is a kindness. If he reprove me, it is excellent oil upon my head. So if a person tells you that you're wrong and shows you that you're wrong and proves it, you know what? You ought to be happy. It's a kindness that has been done to you. It is excellent oil. Look at this, Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. And this I pray. This is Paul writing to the Philippians. Look what he says to them. This I pray, that your love may abound more, yet more and more, in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ under the glory and the praise of God. You see, the more you love God, the more you will abound in knowledge of His Word and all of His judgments. And guess what? You'll be able to approve things that are excellent. I see a lot of stuff in religion that is not excellent at all. I see a lot of stuff that is terrible as we're going to demonstrate tonight. I see a lot of stuff that is totally outside of God's commands. Well, you know, a lot of individuals don't like to have any commands of God. They don't like to have any instruction. They just want to do what they want to do. But that's not excellent behavior. That's not sincere without offense to the day of Christ. That's not being filled with the fruits of righteousness. And it doesn't bring glory and praise to God through His Son. If you act any kind of way and put Jesus' name on it, do you think that really brings glory and praise to God? The only time you can bring glory and praise to God is when you abound in knowledge. That's what, what does the Bible say is all about. That's what the churches of Christ are trying to do in this area. They're trying to bring information, knowledge, so that you can abound more in knowledge and judgment and you can approve the things that are excellent so that you can be sincere and without offense in the till the day of the, uh, until the day of Christ, being filled with fruits of righteousness so you can truly be a righteous person and give praise and honor to God through Jesus Christ. Well, see how important this is? Now, some individuals say, well, you can't really... Uh, it, you know, the idea that people will know that you're righteous, I just, you know, that, that's, that's, uh, that would end up you being haughty. That'd be you being uh, self-important and all that. Folks, what book have you been reading? Look at this. Look at Psalm 1-1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. Sounds just like Philippians chapter 1 verse 9. His delight, he abounds more and more in the knowledge of God and all of his judgment. His delight is in the law of the Lord and, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now look at this. A person like this, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in his season. Fruits of righteousness, Philippians chapter 1 verse 9. His leaf shall also shall, be, shall not wither and whatsoever he doth shall prosper. Oh, you can tell a righteous man. Yes, you can. He's like a tree by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit, fruits of righteousness. You can see how excellent he is. His leaf does not wither, and whether he doth, whatsoever he doth, it prospereth. Guess what? That's a New Testament passage too. That was then. This is now. Look at what the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 15. Meditate upon these things. Same thing as Psalm 1.1. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them. Guess what? and thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and to the doctrine. Continue in them for doing this. Thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. You see, the psalmist said that when you meditate in God's Word day and night, you will be like a tree that's planted beside the waters, and your fruit will be seen. Everybody will be able to see that whatever you do prospers. Same thing. Your profiting may appear. If you do what? Meditate upon these things. Give yourself wholly to these things. You know, religious people, it's been my experience, they're some of the ignorant, most ignorant individuals out there. They say all kinds of stuff and call it Bible. We have people call in here all the time and say, the Bible says this, the Bible says that. They never can find it. They don't even worry about it just as long as some pastor tells them it's all right. The Bible says that nobody is supposed to judge anybody. You can never point out anybody's sins. Why, if you point out any sins, you'd be cast in the first stone. Read your Bible. That was a trap set, by Jesus, to, uh, set for Jesus by the Pharisees. Who are the Pharisees? Well, you better know something about the Pharisees, Matthew 5, verse 20, except your righteousness exceeds the scribes and Pharisees. You can't even get into Jesus' kingdom. The Pharisees was Jesus' enemy, his arch rival, the 
individuals who were constantly being preached again and against and exposed by Jesus. Was He knocking them and bashing them? You better believe it. On every corner. Why? Because they were not righteous. They proclaimed their righteousness while condemning everybody else. But Jesus said they actually had their own commandments that they had substituted for the truth. And He said, You draw nigh to Me with your lips, Matthew chapter 15, 8, 8, 15, 8 but your heart is far from Me. Why? Teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. These individuals had made up all kinds of different things to substitute for what God had said to do. And Jesus said they are not righteous. And tonight, you can know an individual who is righteous. His profiting will appear. And His prayers are being answered. And He gives praise and glory to God. Is He self-righteous? No. He is righteous because He has a broken heart and a contrite spirit towards God and His commands. And He trusts in the blood of Jesus Christ and God our Father who will continually forgive us as a result of that blood being applied as a result of brokenheartedness and contriteness about our sin. You see, when you have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, you're constantly trying to remedy. When your brother comes to you about a trespass and he tells you your, fa your fault, the thing that you've done, if you have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, you're going to try to get right. You're going to constantly be appealing to God to forgive you and God's Son's blood is going to be applied over and over. How many times? Seven times? A, seven times? How about seven times 70? In the Old Testament, now we talk about the Old Testament being the uh, system of law and the New Testament being the system of mercy and grace. Well, if they offered over 1,100 sacrifices a year, how, how much forgiveness is there in the New Testament? It's limitless. God is willing to forgive us limitless amount of sins if we will constantly have a broken and a contrite spirit. Have I committed more than 490 sins? I'm sure I have. Possibly. There's, I, I don't even have it. I wouldn't have a clue. I am constantly having to break myself down before God and saying, please forgive me this again, God. Please help me through this. Please help me to be able to accomplish this and do better next time with this. Why, even with my family and my wife, I have to apologize to my kids. I have to apologize to my wife. I have to constantly catalog my behavior. I have to watch what I say on this television broadcast. I have to watch what I say in everything I do. And I have to constantly maintain a broken heart and a contrite spirit towards those things that I realize that I've done wrong. Why? Because that's the kind of person that God says is a righteous person. Why? Because you're self-righteous? No, because God will not impute sins to your account. Blessed is the man to whom God will not impute sins. Does that mean that you don't have to try? Well, I thought that Romans chapter 4 said that you don't have to work. It didn't say you don't have to work. It says that you can actually be counted righteous in spite of. That's what it's teaching. It's in spite of the fact that you haven't done all of the things that you're supposed to do. But if you have a contrite a broken heart and a contrite spirit, as David did, who's the example in Romans chapter 4 verse 5, it's David. As, look at David. Here was a man who committed atrocities. But yet God would not put, impute those sins, would not count those sins to his account. Why? Because he has a broken heart and a contrite spirit about it when he was approached. So you see, this is the kind of thing that we're seeing here. Now, let's notice this then. Let's notice tonight the Old Testament system versus the New Testament in regard to righteousness today and reproof. Now, here's what we do. We get on television and we basically say there is a right way and if what we're saying the Bible says is right, if it smites you, then it's a kindness that we've done to you. And if we reprove you, in other words, tell you your fault, then it is, should be excellent oil on your head. You should appreciate it. Because, see, it really takes a friend. It really takes a person who is concerned to get on here and tell things that are wrong when the whole world is bent on doing wrong. Folks, people don't care about God today. We have all kinds of ungodliness going on in the religious world and outside the religious world. You can't hardly tell the difference anymore. I have more people want to beat up on me who are religious than the people who are not. The only person that I can remember that was really upset with me who doesn't go to church is the guy who said he wished I would die and then he changed. He repented. He cried and repented. He cried and apologized for saying that. And Bob Lawson, the agnostic. Those are, those are the only two individuals that I know of so far that are, that are outside of religion that wanted to hurt me. The rest of the people who wanted to hurt me are people who are supposedly religious. And what have I done? I have smitten them with the Word of God and I have reproved them with the Word of God. 
Well, let's just have a look and let's just see what this is all about because if somebody tells you that something you're doing is wrong and it is wrong, guess what? They've done you a kindness. If they reprove you, tell you their fault, tell you your, their, your fault and they're actually right, you know what? It should be excellent oil to your head. In other words, it's going to be a blessing. Do you know that in the Old Testament, you see the biggest thing that we have problems with today when we talk about righteousness has to do with pattern theology. We encourage people to realize that righteousness is involved in following the New Testament pattern. You see, the apostles came along and preached Jesus Christ and forgiveness through His blood. Our trust in His blood and that we are supposed to keep the, uh, the uh, as we showed in Philippians chapter 1 verse 9 a moment ago, the knowledge and the judgments, that we abound more in love and that we, have no we learn knowledge and judgments. And this will be excellent. So what is this knowledge and judgment? Well, they wrote all these letters telling the people how to behave themselves as Christians. And we're basically saying it's a pattern for behavior. Do we keep it perfectly? No. We know the pattern. We study it. Well, some people don't even believe there is a pattern. Well, let's just get down to it. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, "...who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for, see, saith he, Thou shalt make, excuse me, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed thee in the mount. Who would deny today that Moses wasn't shown a pattern of how to make the tabernacle and all the things involved in the tabernacle? Who would deny that? Who would even try, who would even want to deny that Moses was given specific instructions, in other words, a pattern of how to make this beautiful tabernacle and all of the curtains and all of the dressings and all of the tools whereby they were going to worship? No one would deny that. Everybody knows there was a pattern. But see, when you get to the New Testament, everybody says, well, you do what you want to do. Billy Graham is Jesus, all of a sudden. Billy Graham says, the church of your choice. And everybody does what they want to do. But you know what? The New Testament is a pattern also. Notice this, Philippians chapter 3, verse 16. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk as you have uh, so as you have us for an example. See, folks, there is a rule. We're supposed to walk by the same rule or the same pattern. The New Testament is a pattern for righteousness. Are we going to be righteous as a result of ourselves keeping the pattern perfectly? No. We're going to make mistakes. But we're trying to keep the pattern. We're trying to follow the plan of Jesus. But inside the plan, we have... Uh, we have uh, we have a situation or we have a means by which we can fix our mistakes. What is it? The blood of Jesus Christ and our faith in that blood, our trust in God that He will forgive us through the, the blood of His Son. You see, we're constantly trying to walk by this rule and see many of you deny there is a rule. You say you can do, and, and it's getting worse. The people say you can do anything. And yet Paul said, let us walk by the same rule. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. Have you ever noticed this verse? If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, I have people that just get irate when I say that you're supposed to teach doctrine and that we're supposed to follow rules. This guy that... Uh, I'm not going to get ahead of myself. I'm going to show an instance in just a moment. I'm going to show an instance of how far crazy that we have gone in this idea that there are no rules. People do not want to have any kind of rules. And guess what? Religious pastors are bowing down to that stuff and they're basically saying, okay, you do what you want to do. And they don't even know verses like this, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. They'll actually have a church that's caught, that has nothing to do with the words of Jesus Christ. Don't even worry about whether or not it follows the example of Jesus' church. Don't worry about any kinds of rules inside that church. Just make them up as you go. Doctrine, they say the doctrine doesn't matter at all. But yet this, this verse ends up concluding in verse 5, withdraw from anybody who teaches otherwise and will not consent to wholesome words. What kind of words? Even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrine which is according to godliness. The rules that the Apostle Paul and others wrote and laid out in the New Testament. This is what we call the New Testament. All these letters to the churches, they're about rules. They're about the words of Jesus Christ. They're about the doctrine of godliness. And people don't study them. They don't know them. They don't know anything about them. They just do what they want to do and they call it Christianity. Well, in the Old Testament, notice what the Bible says. In the Old Testament days when they had that pattern and they wouldn't follow it, Leviticus 26.30, I will destroy your high places and I will cut down your images and I will cast your carcass upon your idols and my soul shall abhor you. 
And I will make your cities waste and bring your sanctuary into desolation and I will not smell the savor of your sweet odors. The sweet odors of their sacrifices. He would not smell them. He can't stand them. He said, I abhor them. And by the time we get to Isaiah, they had gotten so wicked and it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell, there shall be stink. And instead of a girdle, a rent, instead of a well-set uh, hair, baldness. And instead of a stomacher, a girding of sackcloth and burning instead of beauty. Your worship will stink. I will abhor it. You know, when you leave the pattern, you know what you get? When you leave God's ha a pattern and you start building your own uh, uh, forms of, of righteousness or means of worship to God, you're just building a spiritual outhouse. It just stinks to the high heaven. And God says, it just stinks and I abhor it. But see, if you follow the pattern in the Old Testament and in the New, then guess what? It is a sweet smell and a savor unto God. And it says the same thing in 2 Corinthians as it said in Leviticus, talking about a sweet smell. Well, we need to ask ourselves tonight, how far are we going to go before we turn and realize that we have totally left any semblance to Christianity in the New Testament? Listen, I'm trying to be your friend. A person who smites you, a person who is righteous and smites you, tells you your fault, they, that is a kindness to you. In, in, in it, to instruct you and help you to return to New Testament Christianity instead of something that stinks before God. Listen, folks, this religion uh, in, in the United States, it stinks to God and it stinks to people too. Do you know that our nation is fast becoming an agnostic and atheist nation? In Virginia itself, half of Virginia doesn't even go to church. In the last census, not the one that we just had, but the one before that. Listen, folks, a lot of time has passed since the other census. The, the one before the one we just finished, half of Virginia said that they weren't going to church at all. How many people you think have quit church since then? You know a bunch of people that have. I know a bunch of people that have. And one of the reasons why they do is they said church stinks. Religious people stink. They're a bunch of hypocrites. The pastors tell you that you're supposed to do this and you're supposed to do that and not supposed to do this and not supposed to do that. And then the pastor does everything he tells you not to do and the things he tells you to do, he doesn't do. Sounds just like Jesus' day. Jesus said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. He said the things that they tell you to do, that do, but don't do as they do. Don't do as they do. Just like Jesus' days. And Jesus was a person who was their friend. And He smote them with God's Word and He reproved them with God's Word and they killed Him for it. Well, I want to ask you tonight, if we're not going to turn, if, if you're not going to listen to me, if you're not going to listen to the Word of God that we're preaching on these broadcasts, how far are we going to go? Just how far is this thing going to get? Well, you've got a guy that came on last week or two weeks ago and let's just listen to his prayer and then we'll go back and talk about it. Let's just listen to this. This is... The buzz all over the nation was a week ago or two weeks ago. Take a listen. This is a guy, a Baptist pastor at NASCAR. Take a listen. Brace with Pastor Joe in Nashville, Tennessee. And the NASCAR Nationwide Series race where Pastor Joe Nelms delivers one of the most unusual pre-race prayers you will ever hear. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for all your blessings you said in all things give thanks. So we want to thank you tonight for these mighty machines that you brought before us. Thank you for the Dodges and the Toyotas. Thank you for the Fords. And most of all, we thank you for Roush and Yates partnering to give us the power that we see before us tonight. Thank you for GM Performance Technology and the R07 engines. Thank you for Sunoco Racing Fuel and Goodyear Tires that bring performance and power to the track. Lord, I want to thank you for my smoking hot wife tonight, Lisa. My two children, Eli and Emma, or as we like to call them, the little E's. Lord, I pray you bless the drivers and use them tonight. May they put on a performance worthy of this great track. In Jesus' name, boogity, 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 amen. Oh, and the NASCAR crowd just loved it. Look at this. Critics have blasted Tennessee pastor for being disgraceful or disrespectful, but Nams told the Christian Post Monday that he was just trying to change things up. Now, you're changing things up 
by using lines from Talladega Nights, one of the vilest movies that you will see, only a PG-13 rating, but it was filth, full of filth, homosexuality, all kinds of sexual innuendo, things of that nature. You get online and you read the stuff that is stated about this filthy, filthy uh, a movie and a Baptist preacher is using the lines from it in his prayer and he just wanted to change things up. I'm sure God wanted to hear about his smoking hot wife and the disrespect of using these kinds of lines in a prayer is just unbelievable. But folks, this is the hem of the garment. This is nothing compared to what people are doing today in the name of, of religion. People aren't even... There, there is absolutely no shame when it comes to religion today. Let's just notice a few things. Have you heard of alternative worship? Folks, we need to wake up to what's happening. And, and, and basically, you folks out there who are saying, well, you go to the church of your choice. It doesn't matter. There's no pattern. There's no, there's no rules. There's nothing that really uh, to say that you can't do this or you can't do that. And besides that, you're not supposed to judge. And if you say anything to anybody, well, are you supposed to cast the first stone if you don't have any sins? You better wake up and read your Bible. You better find out what Jesus was saying to the scribes and the Pharisees and make sure you don't apply it to the general population. Because, you know what? You start saying to the general population that nobody can correct anybody, and you know what the general population will do in religion? They'll turn God's religion, God's ways, into a spiritual outhouse is what they'll do. You think I'm kidding? You just wait till you see what I'm going to bring up. Here's a short introduction to alternative worship. What is alternative worship? Well, alternative worship, it's on signs around here everywhere. It's where you old people don't satisfy the young folk anymore. And you have your worship one time and then they come in and worship later. They just do all kinds of stuff. What do they do? Well, let's notice some of the stuff. Alternative worship is what happens when people create worship for themselves in a way that fully reflects who they are as people and the culture that they live their everyday lives in. You see, what they start doing is they start bringing things that has to do with them and that they enjoy. They bring that stuff into worship. They create a worship for themselves. It's alternative. It has nothing... Well, most of the worship that's going on, even in the regular, what's called uh, normal orthodox, it doesn't have anything to do with the New Testament either. It's foreign. And so these individuals saw that mom and daddy are doing stuff that's not in the Bible, so we'll just do what we want to do. You see, they learned it from their parents because most forms of church have become culturally disconnected from the wider world. Alternative worship can seem like a radical break with conventional church practices. It uses the technology and media of everyday lives, TV, video, CDs, computers, things that we take for granted in domestic environment, but seldom see in churches. It takes much of its content from the secular world, the music, the language, often, often the imagery, because it sees the presence of God in these things and knows that the spirituality has to make sense in the context of our secular lives if it is to nourish us and to help us to be salt and light. That's baloney. You don't have to have everything that is in this world around us in your worship service. Just because you happen to like some uh, singer, some rock and roll singer, some country singer, doesn't mean that you need to move country music and rock and roll music, alternative whatever, into, into God's worship. These individuals, when we go there and show their worship, it's just as wild as a concert. That's what they're doing. It's alternative. They brought their world into God's world, and they don't even realize that that's not helping them. Is a concert helping you be a better person? No, it gives you chill bumps, but is it helping you be a better person? Absolutely not. You better go back to the New Testament and find out what it was that God says makes you a better person. Well, what was it? We saw it in Philippians chapter 1-9. Abound more and more in love, and you start having knowledge of God's judgments. Then you can approve those things which are excellent. And let me tell you what, alternative worship is not excellent. Austin First Baptist Church, Austin, Texas, March 2001. Why am I showing you something 2001? Because I'm trying to show you this was 10 years ago. What do you think is going on today? Look at this scene. These individuals, look at how they're basically uh, trying to build this scene. It looks like a stage at a concert. Well, you can't see what's going on down here. And you might say, well, what's, what's wrong with that? Well, let's look a little bit closer. All of the trash from the street has been brought in and it's been put up on the stage where the pulpit usually was and where the table for the communion usually was. And all this trash is strewn around so these individuals can bring their real world into worship. And what does the heading say? 
Let's notice together. A Eucharist, or a, that's basically a Thanksgiving blessing, installation of trash and earth which brought the grime of the city into the sanctuary. The bread was wrapped in a cloth in the earth. The wine bottle was passed around in a paper sack such as street people use. The ambient soundtrack was by Tim Cloudburst Westcott. Boy, that's very nice, isn't it? Wouldn't you just love to get up there and wallow in that trash and be involved in this Eucharist that the Baptist Church in Austin is involved in? Alternative worship. Well, guess what? You can't say anything about it. You've already told me that you can't judge. One church is as good as another. Nothing really is wrong. You who have, uh, without sin, cast the first stone. So you can't say anything about this garbage. And, and I'm not being facetious. Guess what it is? It's garbage, but they're calling it worship. It's alternative worship. Why don't all you folks just go over there and, and, and um, basically fill your assembly with this kind of stuff? You can't say it's wrong because, see, you've already said that nothing really can be condemned. If you condemn anything, then you're going to be condemned. If you judge, you're going to be judged. You see the predicament that we found ourselves in? You all opened the door for this garbage. That's what it is. Look at it. It's garbage. And they're actually glad to tell that it's garbage. Can you imagine individuals thinking they're getting closer to God because they're passing the fruit of the vine around in a paper bag like the persons on the street do? Alcoholics? Let's all act like alcoholics. Well, you're all acting like you're drunk in the Pentecostal church anyway. Listen, folks, wake up. Individuals tell me that Acts chapter 2, verse 13, because the enemies of Peter and John said these men are drunk, that they must have been acting drunk. I seem like I remember them saying in Luke chapter 3 that Jesus was a wine bibber. Does that mean Jesus really was acting like a wine bibber? Would anybody affirm that Jesus had anything to do with the activity that made him look like a wine bibber? Well, his enemy said he was. See, he wasn't anything like that. That's just what his enemies were saying. And the enemies of Peter and Paul were saying when they were speaking in languages that 15 different nationalities understood that they were drunk. That doesn't mean they were acting drunk. And that doesn't mean that you can run around a building like a wild banshee or a chicken with your head cut off and you'd be doing like they were doing on the Pente day of Pentecost. That's what their enemies were saying. You see, they're celebrating this garbage in the name of Jesus. And you may be saying, well, Johnny, you're just bringing up all kinds of stuff that's just you know way out there. This is not way out there. This is the norm today. Young people everywhere, in contrast to normal worship, normal alternative worship practice, uh, somebody, I don't know this guy's name, services consist largely of words, but words of such brilliance and passion that nobody minds. Oh boy, their worship consists of words, but these words are so brilliant and passion, filled with passion that nobody minds that it's just words. What in the world does that mean anyway? Take a look at this one. Notice the same group of individuals. It says the service is called heresy because nearly of all of our beliefs about God began as heresies. God is other and will act in ways contrary to our understanding. Sometimes we need to lose even the things we hold dear about God so that a deeper knowledge can grow. God, rid me of God. Boy, that was profound, wasn't it? We can really grow. I, I, I've got this line. It's, it's, it's just words. Now, excuse me that it's just words. You know, we're, we're saying here that our, this, word, this particular assembly just consisted mostly of words. But, you know, they were such brilliant and passionate, nobody minded. Well, what was their brilliant and passionate? How did they display their brilliance and their passion? They said, God, rid me of God. And now, guess what? I'm closer to God. Talk about ridiculous. Folks, this is where we're headed in religion. And guess what? You folks who said you can't say anything about anything anybody else does, Billy Graham started this stuff. We can put up our phone lines now. We've got about 20 minutes, I think, maybe 15. And it may be that you want to get in on our program tonight. Now, I showed this. Now, now this gentleman here, you're probably going to be thinking, well, this guy looks too normal for anything to be wrong. Look how normal he is. Well, he's a Baptist guy. Went to uh, the... Uh, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary over in Fort Worth. While we're waiting on our phone lines, let's listen to what's going on over in, in Dallas. Now, Gogan is a conservative evangelical Christian, a graduate of the prestigious Dallas Theological Seminary and pastor of the Agape Bible Fellowship, Diane Cohen's Church. Our church service is, is pretty, it's, it's normal. Yeah, we open in prayer, we sing praise songs, we uh, open the Word of God most importantly. At first glance, that seems about right. On a recent Saturday, we visited Agape, and it seems like any other church in any other town. 
But the paper towels and shopping bags stacked neatly in the back of the room are a clue that something's different here. When they are brought out, it's a sign that the fireworks are about to begin. Most of our services are just a normal Baptist service. Until we get to the end when we tackle the believers. And when Pastor John says tackles, he means it literally. Agape Bible Church is a deliverance church where they say they expel demons through prayer. I bind you. No. I bind you. No. Okay, just your everyday Baptist church until you start tackling the believers. You're on, what does the Bible say? How you doing, John? Welcome back. Ah, uh, thank you. Appreciate that. I'm glad to be back. Well, you didn't talk me a whole lot tonight. Well, I appreciate that. Appreciate that. I haven't heard from you in a long time. You still over in Martinsville? No, I'm, I'm in Reedsville. Oh, you're in Reedsville. Okay, I got you confused with the guy that I used to visit over in Martinsville. No, I just call you and talk to you on the phone. Okay. All right. Good to yeah, hear from I'm, you. But you didn't talk me a whole lot tonight. Well, I appreciate that. Do you think we're going in the wrong direction a lot of time out here in religion? No, you you did on track. All right, appreciate that. Appreciate that. What can we thank do? You. All right, thank you for the call. All right, now folks, that just demonstrates, and we have this every single time that we come on. We have individuals that are appreciating what we do, and then we have groups that basically, I guess, they're fine with tackling people in church. You're on what's the Bible say? Yes, sir. Normal Baptist church before we start tackling the believers. I cannot believe what I just heard. Okay, and that's that's ABC. Uh, there, and I'm telling you, ABC is loving this. They, I think these big uh, news conglomerates are on a crusade to try to make religion look as crazy as they can. Uh -huh. And I really think they love that. So you're saying you just can't believe that this is going on? Uh -uh. Well, what do you think about what we're actually saying? If we don't have some kind of rule, then anything goes, doesn't it? Exactly. All right. Well, I appreciate your observation. What else? Got anything else you want to uh, present? Well... I would be exactly horrified if I was in a church and they started tackling people. Well, especially, you know, given too, this happens to be a man, but what if it had been, you know, what if I'd been there and that was my wife? Exactly. And I'm going to turn the sound down and we'll go ahead and let the rest of it play. And, you know, we haven't seen the ridiculous just yet. I mean, that's a, a grown man there. And, uh, you know, this yelling and moaning and carrying on, but it, it gets worse, you know, uh, hmm. if you watch here. Uh, the, these individuals are yawning and finally they start passing gas and that's supposedly demons and then uh, after that uh, mucus starts coming up I just you know I just can't imagine why these people are doing this there's nothing biblical you know about this uh, at all but then you're gonna see just in a moment that it just really gets out of hand let me turn it back up Stout get, out of get out of Owen you loose him and let him go He's a young man of God. Now, come on. Now, he's eight years old, and he was crying, get off of me, and these people are all tackling this child. So it just gets wilder. This is like some Pentecostal stuff right here. Okay. Now, what background have you... Uh, you, you sound like you might have been in the Baptist background. That that kind of surprised you a Baptist? Yeah, I'm a Baptist now, but I used to go to a holiness church, and I have never seen anything like that in my life. Uh, you had never seen what the holiness, uh, this kind of activity? Yes, I'd never seen it. Okay. What, what about in the holiness churches? Did you see, you saw people on the floor but not tackling each other? Yeah, not, not tackling people like they're at a football game. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, I appreciate you calling in tonight because you, you really are making, you're sounding like a voice of reason for our program tonight, and I do pre uh -huh. pre appreciate you participating. All right, I appreciate you. All right. Too. Thanks for the call. All right, so basically we're making sense tonight. You're on What's the Bible Say? Uh, hey, Johnny, you just uh, brought something to my attention with this showing you have there. How do they determine what's the Holy Spirit and what's demons? Because to me, it looks the same. It, absolutely. I mean, you know, people falling on the floor. Well, which is it? Is it the Holy Spirit or is it a demon? Should we tackle him or should we praise him, let, he do, let him do what he wants? And, you know, this, this is similar to what we've been saying about Luke chapter 9. The demon-possessed person in Luke chapter 9 was a person who foamed at the mouth and was tearing at himself and falling on the ground, and yet they call that what happens when you get the Holy Ghost. And now, now we have it right here on television. You can't tell the difference between demon possession and what they do. And this other guy who said he was in the Holiness Church, he said the only difference is, is they're tackling people and the Pentecostals just roll around on the floor. 
Well, thank you for presenting. Okay. I'll let the next caller through. All right. Thanks for the call. All right. You're on What's the Bible Say? Johnny, I want to say that I really appreciate how you've articulated the Word of God so strongly tonight. And I think there is a passage that summarizes exactly what you said. First Peter chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. And here's the points I want to make from it. One is, you got to obey the gospel to be in the house of God or the church. And when you obey the gospel and you become a member of the house of God, you are then therefore righteous, which is in contrast to ungodly and sinner. And you know, I know that you have heard, and I've heard this too, that if the righteous scarcely be saved, I've heard denominational people quote this verse, they know that you're supposed to be righteous. The only time that they bring this stuff up is when we're basically condemning some of their behavior and then they start acting like nobody is really supposed to be righteous. But I've heard them use this verse incorrectly most of the time, but you're right. Appreciate that. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Folks, it is very important tonight for us to realize that unless you're in God's kingdom, we started out with that tonight, that except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, you cannot enter into the kingdom. Well, we need to tell you tonight that you cannot just get into the kingdom just by believing. You have to be translated into the kingdom. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13. Who shall, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption through the blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Tonight, you need to get into Jesus' kingdom. What Jesus already said in the beginning of our lesson, except your righteousness exceeds some folks' righteousness, you can't enter in. That's Matthew 5 verse 20. And tonight, in order for you to get into the kingdom, there is an entrance process. This evening, you need to realize that you don't believe into the kingdom. You do believe that Jesus Christ is the king. You believe that He died and He raised from the dead. And you must confess your belief, but you're not in the kingdom. You don't get in the kingdom until you have faith enough in God to do what God says in order to contact God's Son's blood. You have to get into the body. That's how you're translated. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. Therefore, we are buried with Him by baptism. If you have not been buried with Him by baptism, how in the world can you be raised up to walk in newness of life? If you reject the part of the process to get into the kingdom, into Jesus Christ, guess what? How are you ever going to be raised to walk in newness of life? Look at verse 5, Romans chapter 6, verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, well, if you haven't been baptized, you haven't been planted in the likeness of His death. Well, what's the consequence? Or what do you forfeit? We shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. If you refuse to be planted in the likeness of His death, guess what? You might as well forget about being raised to walk in newness of life. You have rejected the process by which you get into the kingdom of God's dear Son. And your righteousness must exceed some righteousness of other individuals. You're on what's the Bible say? Hey, Johnny, how you doing? I'm good. Hey, welcome back. Thank you. Hey, listen, I had a question though. In in First Corinthians and uh chapter four, when Paul was talking to uh the Corinthians and about the division of the church. Okay. And uh he talked about uh righteousness in our eyes versus uh in the book of life when we get judged. And he says that uh people give people approval that they don't have the right to and, and can you interpret that? I'm not questioning your... Well, I, I'm not... You're, if, since you're not quoting exactly right, I'm not really recognizing the, the particular verse that you're talking about. As I'm looking through 1 Corinthians 4, I don't see what you're actually saying. Okay, it goes... I'm going to start at 3. Okay, it's a very small thing that I should be uh, judged of you or, or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self, for I know nothing by myself, yet I am hereby justified. But yet I... Yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is God. Okay, what are you trying to make out of that? Well, I, it wasn't a conflict, but I'm just saying, you know, uh, at times people who are claiming themselves to be Christians elevate themselves to a position where they take the place of God and say, well, I'm going to heaven and you're not. No, that's not taking the place of God. Are you saying tonight, Mike, that no one can say that anybody else is not going to heaven? Uh, they can say it, but they don't have the final say so. Yes, yes. look at, look at this. It. Look at this. I'm going to move one chapter. All I'm going to do is move one chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to move one chapter 
And Paul, the person that you're saying is saying that you shouldn't say somebody's going to heaven or not, says, Verily, as absent in the body, present in the spirit, I've judged already as though I were present concerning him that done this deed. In the name of Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan. You see that? Deliver such a one to Satan. Now, Paul, who you say is saying that you can't judge about where somebody's going, is actually telling these brethren one chapter later to send this person back to Satan. Now, how is he doing that? I was saying, Johnny, what I was saying, Johnny, I wasn't called to be confrontational the first part. Okay, I've we're not being confrontational. We're just making sure that the community doesn't get a wrong understanding of what it is that you said. Because you said one person doesn't have the right to say that another person is going to, not going to heaven. And I'm showing that the Apostle Paul said the very thing. He said this person needs to be delivered to Satan. Well, I'm, I may take that, I'm not saying they don't have the right to say that, but I'm saying they don't have the final say-so who's going to heaven. Well, the final say-so really would be up to you whether you repent or not. Would that not be so true? To, I mean, I can have faith. But do, do you say that I can say that I'm going to heaven and know it for sure? Absolutely you can know if you're going to heaven. Well, I, I believe that, Johnny. I mean, I wasn't being confrontational, but what I'm saying, though, I, I don't look at other people and say to them that, you know, you're going to heaven or hell because now, Mike, I'm on. Mike, I have actually, I have you on tape saying some pretty strong things about people. And, you know, let's, let's just be real tonight. We I, I all, say what is true. We all know that individuals say that other individuals are not doing right. And what is our standard of right? Yeah, but I don't say whether they're going to heaven or hell. Well, it doesn't matter if you're willing to say it or not, but the Bible says it. If you're not willing to be righteous... You're going to hell. Simple as that. The Bible says clearly, Mark 16, 15, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. If you refuse to believe Jesus Christ and be baptized, you're going to hell. Now that's what the Bible says. Be damned. I, I can say that. And it's not Johnny. It's the Scripture. But I can say to you, Mike, if you don't do that, if you haven't done that, you're going to be damned. Well, well, Johnny, like I said, we don't have uh, disagreements when it comes to the Word. I just think sometimes when people interpret it, and, so, and I myself sometimes uh, become judgmental and we put ourselves above others, and I try to get away from that. But I was just asking in return what was Paul meaning in that reference. Well, we know what Paul wasn't meaning. He was not meaning that you cannot say that somebody is hell-bound because one chapter later he says that this guy who's fornicating is to be delivered to Satan and there to withdraw from this individual, not to be associated with him until he repents. So he wasn't saying in 1 Corinthians 4 that he could not make any judgment. Now we don't have, but we actually have gone two minutes over in your call, so if we want to discuss this, we're going to, have to discuss it on another show. I, this second hey, Johnny, time you... and I thank you and welcome back, brother. Okay, appreciate the call. All right, thank you, for, right. Thank you for being with us tonight. We uh, actually need to, to get back to our uh, screen here. I actually had an ending, I thought, um, a screen where I showed uh, some of our uh, contact information and let's see if I can find that right quick and then we will go off the air this is it this was it right there let's put this contact information up and I want to go off with my uh, commercial we want to remind you that we are now on Ustream all you have to do is, is uh, type in this word Ustream and once you get to Ustream, you type in in the search box, what does the Bible say with Johnny? And you can watch this broadcast live, our other broadcast this past week live, and you can watch some of our debates live. And we want to go off with our um, this uh, commercial that we put together and hope that you will think about it very uh, strongly and we'll wish you a good night. Colbert ever in this greenhouse, say last night about midnight. Good, Ashby. Yeah. You saw it. I saw it. But what are you going to do about it? <laughs> <laughs>